All right, so I'm recording now. Um, so I'll make sure I try to address questions in the chat and I'll say them out loud so that way people who are watching this after the fact can get the benefit of those. Um, there will be a bit of a delay, so if you have any questions and it seems like I'm not responding to it, it's just because it takes me a few seconds to, to see it potentially. Um, but if you have any questions from the last time when we covered, uh, I think we went over erectile dysfunction and went over BPH and all the medications we're going to use for that. Um, and now we can get into talking about urinary incontinence. We'll finish up this section and kind of see what we get through um, in the geriatric section coming up next here. So. Without further ado, let's see. Okay, so when we're talking about urinary incontinence, essentially this is this involuntary leakage of urine, right? And so typically there's some degree of urgency associated with this, and you know it can be problematic for your patients in terms of like frequency if it's really disruptors their daily routines and they can have nocturia, which we know is particularly bad for elderly patients because we worry about things like, you know, them getting up in the middle of the night and falling. Not only that, but obviously this can have some big ramifications in terms of their self-esteem and can do things like worsen depression and whatnot. So in terms of when this occurs, you see this a lot in um, especially patients who are kind of getting on in years you see this more in women typically especially those that like have had kids previously and things like that um, but also you want to think about especially in the elderly patients who are not able to really control their bowels well anymore this is a big reason for them to be institutionalized so going to like assisted living facilities and things like that um, really problematic because we know that people tend to um, sort of decline faster when they're kind of taken out of their home environment and they're away from friends and family and things like that so if we can avoid that that's obviously going to be great um, we know about the ur lower urinary tract in terms of the anatomy already so you guys know that pretty well um, but also we want to think about the urothelium as well in terms of like what kind of effects um, things that like hormones are going to have on that so for instance things like estrogen tend to um, cause that uh, tissue to hypertrophy which can help with continence whereas if you were to have say someone who's menopausal they can actually end up having some atrophy of that tissue which we'll see can lead to things like you know in in urinary incontinence um, in terms of the neurophysiology, this is really important to understand our, how our medications are going to work. So the detrusor muscle on the bladder, we know is going to be innervated with these parasympathetic fibers here. And, and acetylcholine is going to be the main thing that's going to be stimulating that, right? So we're going to see that, um, and, and it's not so important that you know if it's an uh, M2 or an M3 receptor, um, but you're going to see that that may have some impact in terms of like specificity for where your medications are working. But we do know that when you have activation of those receptors with acetylcholine, you should see squeeze on that muscle there, which causes urination, which makes sense because we know, um, you know, when you think about your um, your dumbbells, right, you think about your cholinergic sort of effects there, urination is one of those primary things you're going to see, right? Versus, say, if you had like an anticholinergic on board, you would end up seeing urinary retention because those, uh, that muscle is not being stimulated to contract. So uh, other things to consider as well is going to be the urethral sphincter. You want to make sure that that has good um, pressure to ensure adequate closure. And so we do have both a proximal sphincter, which is going to be more involuntary, that's more controlled by, um, you know, especially like the, the parasympathetic nervous system, and then more of a distal sphincter that is mostly voluntary, but you may see that can be overwhelmed in some cases, especially when you're having a lot of um, fluid buildup, right? With the bladder, you should see and expect that it does accommodate increasing volumes, right? So it should allow for that detrusor muscle to relax and allow for more uh, more volume to hold that without increasing the pressure necessarily. And you have to have compliance there because if you don't, and say for instance, like that muscle hypertrophies over time, you're going to see that um, that pressure builds up and that stimulates urination. So we're going to see some issues with bladder um, issues in the long term as well. Um, we see that with BPH previously. You notice that with like chronic retention, that's what led to a lot of those lower urinary tract symptoms that occurred basically the bladder becomes hypersensitive and so ultimately you need to have a coordination between these and if you have disturbances uh, that from really any point whether it be the brain the spinal column etc um, you're going to find some dysfunction here so a um, couple of different types we're going to talk about. First one is going to be stress urinary incontinence, and this tends to be related to uh, urethral underactivity. And so this is where you imagine if you have, say, like a brief burst of activity. So say, for instance, someone's like um, running up the stairs or they sneeze or something like that, um, you can have small amounts of leakage. And so the main things with here is that due to that sort of inadequate closure force, you're going to see that it's a little more episodic. You're going to see that it's typically low volume leakage, so just a little bit um, as 
as compared to some other types we'll see in a moment here. Um, you'll tend to see that a lot of risk factors are associated with like aging and menopause, which makes sense because we mentioned how um, less estrogen causes that urethelium to sort of um, atrophy to some degree. And not only that, but if you think about pregnancy and childbirth, that can cause a lot of anatomical changes as well that kind of predisposes um, female patients to having urinary incontinence, right? Typically, it's pretty rare in men, but you may see it in like maybe someone who's had uh, prostate surgery and had a prostatectomy, something like that. But also think about drugs that may aggravate this, right? So imagine something like an alpha antagonist, like the ones we talked about previously for BPH, like um, prazosin or doxazosin or something like that. That can actually cause relaxation of that urethral smooth muscle, causing some stress in urinary incontinence to occur or even think about things like just mechanically like an ACE inhibitor causing cough right obviously ARBs are going to be less likely but ACE inhibitors certainly um, are going to be a, a concern there in terms of causing that cough due to that bradykinin buildup so the other type we're mainly going to look at is going to be urge urinary incontinence and this is more related not necessarily to uh, urethral issues but more of a bladder issue right so um, typically you're going to see that uh, patients will have this desire to void they're going to have this urgency associated with that and it's either related to say detrusor overactivity so imagine if you had something that was causing too much stimulation of those muscarinic receptors um, they can have that right and, and again it's a little different than overactive bladder it's not an issue of frequency necessarily but more of an urgency issue and so this could be idiopathic or it could be related to um, issues of like aging or we mentioned like bladder outlet obstruction like BPH um, and certainly can be worsened by things like, you know, diuretics and certainly alcohol. You know, alcohol decreases um, antidiuretic hormone release that causes, um, you know, urination to occur there too. So a couple of different reasons why that may happen. So, and then there's gonna be overflow incontinence. And so this can be sort of a combination of urethral under, or I'm sorry, overactivity and or bladder underactivity. And basically what happens here is that you're having a sort of a backup of fluid. Um, and so the bladder basically is unable to empty. And so you're kind of chronically holding on to too much urine. And so you tend to see that this may be related to urethral hyperactivity due to BPH in men, or it could be related to some neurologic diseases. So. If you imagine someone had like say a spinal cord injury or MS or something like that. And then overall you're gonna see as well, bladder underactivity such that you're gonna have incomplete voiding um, that can occur here. So this may be related to that long-term bladder outlet obstruction. Um, diabetes can have a role to play in this as well as due to some of the um, neuropathies that can happen uh, with long-standing diabetes and whatnot. So um, you'll see some of our medications that can cause urethral hyperactivity, maybe things like um, alpha agonists that causes smooth muscle constriction. So if you imagine, um, say something like Sudafed, right? We use Sudafed as a decongestion, it can cause alpha activation that can squeeze down on that smooth muscle in the urethra, or maybe like a TCA, uh, for instance, it can do this as well. Um, and then from the bladder out aspect, it can decrease that contractility. A lot of your anticholinergics, um, things like calcium channel blockers even you want to think about, is that causing inhibition of smooth muscle constriction, antipsychotics, so a lot of medications that can play a role with this. So in terms of like their presentation, it depends on kind of what's going on in terms of the underlying path, pathophysiology. So is it an issue of the urethral underactivity? Is it a bladder issue? So you kind of want to figure out what's going on there in terms of like what their symptoms are, um, how often they're going to the bathroom, do they have frequency or is it urgency um, and all of that. And so um, that will dictate sort of which medications you might want to use more, more specifically. So uh, in terms of the course of therapy, it may just be dependent on, say, the volume that you're dealing with, the frequency. You know, if it's like uh, more of a stress urinary incontinence where it's very small volume and it's pretty well predictable with certain types of activity, maybe things like absorbent pads are okay. Um, but we'll look at the pharmacologic therapy that may be most appropriate for this. So um, obviously our goals are going to have restoration of continence. We'd like to reduce the number of incontinent episodes for these patients here. And obviously, like especially when you think about more long-term effects, like hopefully reducing things like complications, like nursing home placement if possible, um, and then minimize the adverse effects that patients are going to experience. We'll see some of the medications, especially in elderly patients, can be a bit problematic, um, especially from like a mental status standpoint. And then obviously overall increase the quality of life for these patients here. 
So generally we're going to find um, that uh, in terms of our approach, we're going to go with this is that drug selection really has to be based on the urinary incontinence type. So is it an issue of bladder overactivity or is it to do with the urethral underactivity? What's going on here, right? Consider the comorbid conditions that are going on there. Um, and you may find that, um, you know, we want to focus on combining both the non-pharmacologic therapies along with our drugs potentially. And if they can get away with just using non-pharm stuff, then that's fine. That's totally perfect. Uh, but we'll see frequently we have to add on drugs in order to help out with this. So um, for more mild to moderate symptoms, you know, the non-pharmacologic therapy is great. This is where we can do things like um, behavioral interventions, right? So if we know they have a lot of um, frequency at nighttime, like maybe um, moving around when they're drinking fluids, maybe having a cutoff point, you know, um, maybe doing things like pelvic floor rehabilitation and things like that. And depending on the patient, you may need to have caregivers sort of help out with this and help out with the you know, scheduling regimens of you know, toileting and things like that. So that's not effective though, then we can get into our medications here. So typically for your urinary incontinence, we're going to see that our anticholinergics are going to be first line here. And so here are several agents we have that are specifically um, approved for this indication. So we have things like oxybutynin, tolteridine, we have trospium, solafenacin, darafenacin, and amphizoteridine. Um, you'll notice that some of these are going to have long-acting formulations. So when you see like ditropan XL, that means, you know, extra long-acting essentially. Detrol LA is long-acting. And so we'll find that there's some benefits to using more long-acting formulations here in just a little bit. So basically what we're going to see is that we're going to antagonize the muscarinic receptors and basically try to suppress or premature detrusor contraction. So ultimately what happens is you're going to enhance bladder storage and, you know, essentially cause urinary retention, which may be effective for these patients here. Um, any of these can be equally effective. The biggest thing is going to be in terms of like side effects and costs and which ones are going to be kind of most appropriate for your patients here. So um, as I mentioned, anticholinergics tend to be first line and we have a lot of dosage for them. So some of them are immediate release, some are long acting. We have transdermal formulations, which can be beneficial from a compliance standpoint, especially if they last, you know, say a couple days or so. And remember your adverse reactions, right? Remember the anticholinergic effects you can expect to see. So I'm sure all of you can recite this by memory, but just for um, just for the video's sake for, for uh, posterity, um, you know, remember mad as a hatter, blind as a bat red as a beet, hot as a match, and dry as a bone, right? The dry as a bone is what we're looking for here, though. That's really what we're going for in terms of trying to decrease secretions and de hold on to that urine a little bit better. But as you might imagine, that's going to lead to a lot of the side effects you can expect to see there. So for instance, if you have a patient who has an issue with constipation, this is going to worsen that potentially, right? There's not a ton of specificity that these drugs may have for these specific receptors on the uh, bladder because you're going to find them kind of everywhere, right? And remember, other comorbid conditions that could be affected by this, things like they have glaucoma could be affected. Uh, things like myasthenia gravis could be affected here as well. And so this may be one of those things where the, the benefits of the drugs may be outweighed by the risk of worsening their comorbid conditions and such that we want to maybe avoid these meds, right? Keep in mind that, and we'll talk more about this in the geriatric section coming up, that um, anticholinergics are typically not great in elderly patients because you can see those mental status changes. You know, um, normally you think low-dose anticholinergics, you know, you think like your Benadryls and things like that, they cause a little bit of sedation and whatnot, but for elderly patients that can lead to like worsen dementia, can worsen their memory. Um, some of them can get like hallucinations, they can get very agitated. So you want to be careful there, right? And then, of course, falls can also be a risk as well um, with these medications. So um, we like extended release preparations mainly because this is going to help out with these side effects. And um, honestly, one of the most common ones you're going to run into is going to be dry mouth, right? So xerostomia can happen here because you're decreasing all of those secretions. And again, that can be problematic, especially if they have really poor dentition. This can lead to things like oral infections and whatnot, uh, but mostly it's just going to be kind of bothersome to them, right? Um, so by using a long acting formulation, you can kind of help decrease those sort of peak dose effects and allow for a nice kind of longer plateau sort of um, effect of the drug there and try to prevent some of those side effects, right? So um, things we're gonna see uh, specifically with oxybutynin, this is a pretty common one. Um, we're gonna see that there is a risk for orthostatic hypotension. There's a little bit of alpha blockade here, which may um, be beneficial to some effects here, depending on kind of what the urinary incontinence is like, um, but that would be a risk, especially with like falls and whatnot. 
Uh, and again, uh, anytime you have an extended release preparation, you really want to make sure you don't have your patients crush or chew these, um, especially, you know, as they get older, they may have issues in terms of, um, you know, being able to swallow, they may have dysphagia issues. And so because of that, we want to make sure they don't crush or, or chew these. The reason that for that is because they can break that formulation and then all that drug gets released all at once. And then that kind of you know, uh, obvious the whole point of using extended release preparation in the first point, right? Um, Tolteridine is a good drug, but you want to be cautious in using these patients with uh, poor creatinine clearances or if they have severe hepatic impairment. Um, and also, you'll see things like tolteridine uh, is metabolized by CYP34, so you may want to reduce that dose if they're on something else that inhibits it, right? Uh, with Trospium, this one is going to be a second generation agent, and this one might be nice um, because it does help out in terms of side effect profile. This one is a quaternary ammonium, which means that it has a, a permanent positive charge on it. Basically, it's a nitrogen with four bonds to it that gives us this permanent positive charge, which makes it more difficult to cross the blood brain barrier, right? So things that have a charge on it don't like to cross membranes, and that includes that blood brain barrier. And so that may help out with some of the um, you know, mental status changes you may see in your elderly patients potentially. Um, some of these, especially like trospium, have pretty poor bioavailability, so you may want to make sure they're taking things on an empty stomach. But remember, we already know that there's going to be scheduling issues with these patients who have a lot of comorbid conditions and a lot of medications. You know, imagine um, this patient has uh, osteoporosis and they're on a bisphosphonate, and now they got to schedule out um, taking their calcium and taking their tolteridine or trospium and all these different things. You can see how scheduling can be pretty problematic in terms of like, well, I guess they're going to be taking meds all day long because they got to separate everything out from a lot of different perspectives there. This is another one, though, you do want to watch out for if they have pretty poor renal function. Some other things you could also consider using would be Botox. Now, um, again, if you want your bladder to look younger and have less wrinkles, I'm just kidding, obviously, but Botox can be useful, right? So we've talked about this before being used for things um, like migraine prevention, right? Especially if you have like some of those muscles on the back of the skull that can kind of um, cause chronic tension and cause headaches. We can use Botox for the same reason here in the bladder, essentially um, working as a paralytic, right? It's a very potent neurotoxin um, that will help to paralyze that smooth and straight and muscle. Um, this way it can basically um, release acetylcholine. It can work um, to allow for better storage if that is the ultimate issue there of bladder overactivity. Now I may see it used as more of an off-label kind of thing here, but certainly I've seen it uh, used for, for this purpose here. Um, you can either directly inject it into the detrusor muscle or the bladder itself, um, and you'll see that the duration of action is pretty good, about four to eight months or so, and then patients may need to go back and have another injection done. Obviously, this would be done like on an outpatient um, surgery sort of setting there. Um, other adverse effects you could expect to see is that maybe the drug works a little too well, and you can see things like kind of urinary retention, which is kind of the point of the drug, but sometimes it works a little too well, um, and also risk for things like UTIs and, and whatnot. So um, again, not without side effects and probably not used first line, but maybe as like a backup agent potentially. So if you have urethral underactivity, some things that can help out with this. So especially in postmenopausal women, this is where estrogens can come into play. Basically it helps with that proliferation, some hypertrophy of that urethral epithelium. Also kind of helps out with say local circulation. And actually they see that it increases the amount of alpha receptors that are available. And we said before that alpha activation causes that smooth muscle constriction, which helps out with that urethral closure pressures essentially. And so depending on which ones you're using, um, you know, we've talked about the risk and adverse effects of estrogen previously so I won't belabor all of that but you know certainly um, this can help out especially if patients have like vaginal atrophy this can really help out with that if you're using say like a, a vaginal estrogen um, but you know oral ones can be used transdermal estradiol any of these things are totally fine um, they will get enough kind of local circulation to help out with that um, urethral effects there um, you'll find the progestins tend to have an antagonistic effect um, so that is one thing to kind of consider if you're using the two together um, Typically, we will see that um, this may not be quite as effective as some of the other agents we've looked at, but um, some people find some additional benefit. And again, they're probably on these for another reason for their menopausal symptoms, so this is kind of like a side benefit they can get from there. Um, I see some patients recommend um, you know, only transdermal formulations, and that tends to get um, kind of better effects in terms of like kind of mitigating systemic side effects while getting um, enough effects for that urethral act activity in and of itself. So again, if they're on oral estrogens for their menopausal symptoms, they'll get this additional benefit. If it's just for urinary incontinence, and maybe stick with something like a transdermal product, right? 
Okay, some other things we can use um, are alpha receptor agonists. And so we tried other things before, like phenylpropanolamine or PPA before, but um, a lot of direct alpha agonists we don't like to use because it can do things like worsen blood pressure. Um, you can see things like stroke risk go up. And so because of that, we don't really like to use these type of drugs anymore. And as a um, sort of a, a way to get around that a little bit, we can use something like duloxetine or like an SNRI that sort of indirectly increases norepinephrine release from the sympathetic nervous system that actually helps with uh, that close uh, that closure pressure a little bit um, so again this is something that's used um, kind of off-label here in the US even though it does have some medications over in Europe um, but you may see this being used for things like stress urinary incontinence so that's one additional agent you can try using so we talked about overflow incontinence already. Um, so specifically, you see this a lot more with issues like BPH. And so um, you can refer back to that section in terms of drugs we can use there. So whether we're using things like finasteride or dutasteride, if it's an issue of an enlarged prostate, or if we're using phosphodesterase inhibitors and things like that, we have a lot of different options there. So you can kind of refer back to that section. So that kind of uh, finishes up for the urinary section now. Does anyone have any questions I can maybe answer? Let me check the sticky board here. Uh, okay, I got some questions here already. Someone did ask when are the assignments gonna be graded? Pretty soon, uh, I'm working on that. Uh, but yeah, that'll be done soon. And then why are five alpha reductase inhibitors a pregnancy category X drug? So that's a good question. Um, basically, um, you know, we talked about our 5-alpha reductase inhibitors preventing the conversion of testosterone over into DHT. And we know that for a developing fetus that we do need those hormones around, right? So um, by inhibiting the formation of DHT, you may inhibit certain um, structural formations from occurring in the developing fetus. And so that has led to birth defects and whatnot. So that's why it's considered a category X. And really there's no indication for a female patient to take that typically. And so because of that, we um, just consider a category X instead of like something like a D for instance. Yeah. Let's see, um, Alex is asking, uh, this is a lot better than the Zoom, by the way, not breaking up on the sound or video freezing. That's fantastic, that's great. That's what I was really hoping for. Um, no offense to you, but I don't really need to see your faces. And so I figured not having all that extra camera feed would help out since this is a little bit more of you know, me shouting at you rather than a, more of a dialogue kind of setting there. So uh, I'm glad this works. I'm gonna try to keep doing this um, in the future, uh, assuming feedback stays good. Um, yes, not like your little cardboard cutout in the corner there. Yes, I figured, People could see me on the actual recording itself. So thank goodness for technology. They can cut me out here. Um, anyway, so um, if no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and switch over and we can do the um, geriatric section here. So we'll see how much we can get through. And if any, if any other questions pop up, feel free to go ahead and type them in the chat or on the sticky board. And I will be more than happy then to answer those. Okay, so up next we're talking about geriatrics and kind of the thing here that you'll find this is a little similar to the PED section and that it's a little bit more conceptual um, than uh, specifically going over a lot of new drugs, but I wanna talk about how these drugs are used in these patients and some of the risks associated with that. Um, we know polypharmacy is a thing, we know these patients are gonna be on a lot of drugs and I wanna talk about some of the things we can try to do to mitigate some of that risk for your patients, you'll see. Um, Again, some of this we've talked about before, right? Because we kind of always talk about uh, the risk of medications and geriatric patients have gone through this because guess what? These are going to be the majority of your patients, especially um, as, uh, you know, the the uh, boomer generation is getting older. You're going to be seeing more of these patients showing up, assuming corona does not knock them all out potentially. So let's hope not. Um, let's see. So getting into the geries. So we know that we're seeing an aging population here. You know that the majority of your patients are gonna be elderly. Um, you know, life expectancy tends to improve as time goes on, um, depending on the health system you're really dealing with. But again, you're gonna see a lot of your patients being elderly. And so one of the big things you wanna do is making sure you're doing good assessments for your patients. And this can be challenging, um, especially when um, maybe patients are not being honest with you, or maybe they have cognitive issues, which prevents that. Um, and there's a lot of different assessments out here. So here's an example of one called a comprehensive geriatric assessment. And I kind of just want to walk you through some of the things that I think are important in terms of medications, some of the, the, the you know, hazard you may run into, some of the um, little tips and tricks and pearls and things like that that I think should be addressed with a lot of your elderly patients there. Um, now, again, I deal with mostly pediatrics, but, you know, you're, you're going to find that, um, you know, you'll deal with these patients regardless um, in a lot of different avenues here. And we see a lot of this, especially like from a toxic 
toxicology standpoint because a lot of these patients have accidental overdoses or they'll have issues to where they have drug interactions that lead to some pretty severe complications here. But one of the big things you want to focus on is not only like how well the medications are working, but also like functionally, what can your patients do, right? So, you know, you may be able to get their blood pressure under control, but if the medication makes it so that they are very dizzy every time they get up and are at risk for falls, then that's not that great of a drug overall, right? And not only that, but I want to make sure that you take advantage of your interdisciplinary team should you have it available. So make sure you're talking to your respiratory therapist and your nutritionist and your pharmacist and all these other people that all have different Different perspectives that can give you a better picture of kind of the patient from a, 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 a more holistic sort of view, not holistic medicine view, but like a more just a whole kind of person view. So, of course, looking at their uh, ability to carry out certain daily activities, you know, so can they get up in the morning? Can they get dressed? You know, do they need assistance with these sort of things? And then not only that, but also looking at, you know, more advanced sort of things. Can they get up and get out? Can they go shopping for groceries? And can they take their own medications? You know, whether what's their memory impairment, you know? Um, so these are things you can kind of um, try to assess for in terms of how well they're able to accomplish these, these things. And not only that, but you can use this as a measure for how well your medications are working too. So um, for instance, if we're talking to a COP, PD patient and they like to garden and they haven't been able to really get out and garden because they keep getting short of breath. But then we start them up on some new steroid therapy, um, give them some, uh, you know, some uh, beta agonists and things like that. And now we follow up with them and they say, yeah, now I can get out and actually garden. That's a big improvement, right? That's a big, um, in terms of quality of life and all these things. And those are things you want to look for, not just like, oh, how do you feel? Like, what can you do? And I think is a, is a really good way to assess how well your drugs are working. So in terms of nutrition, this is really important in terms of um, not only like their actual dietary intake, but also this can have an effect on things like their medication absorption and, and whatnot. Um, so you're gonna find that a lot of these patients may have poor dentition for a variety of reasons that may make it more difficult for them to get adequate nutrition. You're gonna find um, that their appetite may be decreased for a number of reasons like, you know, due to depression, um, maybe there are medications that actually suppress their appetite that may cause um, some degree of weight loss associated with that and then a lot of medical conditions as well so constipation chf uh, dementia all of that not only that but you know consider you know do they have the financial ability to get food and whatnot um, can they prepare a meal i imagine nowadays it can be quite difficult for a lot of elderly patients with uh, the quarantine to actually get out there and get food or if they do make it to the grocery store like is there even anything available right so um you know I can get on the Walmart app and order drive side pickup, but if they don't even have the ability to use technology well, things like that, it could make it very difficult. So you can see some of these kind of real world impacts happening right now. So um, when you're talking to your patients, you know, get an idea of, in terms of like what kind of food, drinks, vitamins, supplements, all of that in a typical 24 hour um, time frame, right? So what kind of foods are they eating? Do they drink enough water or is a lot of their calories coming from alcohol? Um, what kind of supplements are they taking that may be interacting with some of their medications here? And then, you know, see if any kind of like disease states may be affecting um, these things here, right? So, um, you know, you may find that if they're not really getting, or they're trying to say taking a lot of milk because they know they have osteoporosis. Well, maybe that's binding up a lot of other medications that may be um, decreasing their bioavailability, making them less effective, right? So these are things we want to kind of key in on. I know when I was um, on rotations and I was working at a Coumadin clinic, right, for warfarin, um, we recall that vitamin K containing foods are really a big deal. And that includes a lot of like green leafy vegetables and things like that. And I was doing it in Putnam County where a lot of those people grow their own food or they eat a lot of collard greens and kale and spinach and all of that. And that had a huge effect on terms of like how well their medication was going to work. And we wanted to make sure they're being consistent in their diet in terms of how much they were getting in terms of vitamin K content. So um, ask about things like drinks of beer, liquor, or wine. You know, you want to say, uh, how many drinks do you have? And they can say, oh, I have two drinks. Well, how big are those drinks? You know, are they having like a little tiny white claw or is it one of those like big giant tall boys? Um, that makes a big difference. You know, one glass of wine, I mean, technically it could be the whole bottle. You have no idea, right? Um, other things, you know, make sure that, you know, consider do they have money to buy food? Are they um, taking, you know, over-the-counter medications and maybe interacting with the food that they're eating, especially like um, if they're taking iron or calcium uh, supplements, things like that. And then look at their weight, kind of see if it's going up or down over the past six months or so. And again, ask about things like do they have access to, you know, actually physically get out there and shop or can they cook for themselves? Can they feed themselves or do they have help to, with those sort of things? 
In terms of laboratory testing, this is also really important um, to making sure not only to see how our medications are working, but also to see like, can they even process the medications effectively, right? Um, certainly you wanna do your kind of common things like looking at their kidney function, liver function, et cetera. You should be able to get most of that with a complete metabolic panel to get an idea in terms of like what their electrolytes are doing, what their glucose is doing, all of that. Certainly you wanna look at other things too for more long-term sort of therapies. So things like, you know, their lipid panels to see how their hyperlipidemia drugs are working. A1C to see if they're diabetic or if their diabetic meds are working. You'll find some patients, it's kind of funny how they'll be coming in for their fasting labs and they're really non-compliant with their diabetic meds, but they know they're having labs done and they'll go ahead and they'll take everything. They'll use their insulin, they use their sulfonylureas, whatever. And their fasting sugar looks okay, but then you check their A1C and then you show that to them and be like, hey, this is actually really elevated. This is, you know, your average is definitely not good, even though this one value was, was okay. Um, you know, things like urinalysis, all, CBCs, all of these can be really helpful to determine how well drugs are working potentially. So, um, we know that a lot of these geriatric patients are going to undergo polypharmacy, which is typically defined as the use of five or more regular medications here. Um, the reason why we see them using more and more meds is oftentimes because of one, we have longer life expectancy, so people are sticking around for longer, thus they are acquiring more chronic disease states, requiring more medications in order to treat that. Not only that, but you look at your evidence-based guidelines and we'll see, okay, well, maybe we're adding on new medications. Maybe they need to be on an antiplatelet agent for um, their cardiovascular disease, but now they need to be on a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor and maybe a diuretic and all these different things kind of add up over time to where you can see polypharmacy is kind of the rule rather than the exception in a lot of your elderly patients. So, um, you know, imagine you had someone with osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, diabetes, hypertension, and COPD. They may be on like 12 different medications, you know, given five different times per day. Um, and again, uh, it's hard, difficult for people to keep up with even one medication, much less these really complicated regimens here. Not only that, but if you imagine someone gets uh, hospitalized, a lot of patients end up coming out on more medications than what they went on with, uh, in with. Um, you know, it's very rare that people, you know, will actually look at a medication list, you know, providers will look at a medication list on an inpatient and say, okay, well, let's cut out this, this, and this, and we'll send you on your way. Like they usually just add on more medications than not. And so we know that as you increase the number of medications they're on, you're going to see more adverse drug reaction. You know, we can see especially a lot of issues with falls, right? Maybe related to hypotension or sedation, all these different things. Um, also decreased compliance. We know as we make the medication regimens more complicated, we just know inherently compliance is going to go down. Some patients are really with it and they have really good, um, help to make sure their compliance is good most don't and so you're going to see that's going to definitely be an issue there and what's going to happen when you ask your patients when they come in are you taking all your medications like you should they're going to say yes absolutely because they don't want to get guilt tripped from their provider for not sticking with their regimens so um, other things that come into play here, so um, looking at complex dosing schedules. So we know that doing things like um, you know, using combo drugs can help out with this or long acting formulations can help out with this. Um, imagine the economics though, right? So if they can't afford their medications, they may either not buy them altogether or they may start skipping doses. So for instance, they may want to stretch out how long their scripts are working for. And so say maybe they take it instead of once a day, they take it every other day, for instance, right? Um, they may also find that patients are also getting medications that have not been prescribed to them, especially from like family members or friends. Um, so you see a lot of sharing of medications that can occur in these um, elderly populations as well. Um, in terms of mental decline, you know, they may not have the memory capabilities to take drugs at the right time or even take the right medications there. I cannot tell you how many times I've had um, patients call up the poison center and they say, oh my goodness, I, I just accidentally took a second dose of my medications. I forgot I took the first one. Now what do I do, right? Um, I'll tell you a, a very common one I would get uh, if you remember the drug um, teotropium or spiriva is a long acting anticholinergic um, that patients take for COPD it comes as a little capsule that you basically put into a special inhaler um, that will pierce that capsule and then they can inhale the powder um, well it looks like a capsule so what do a lot of elderly patients do well they take it orally right and they call it the poison center freaked out that they're going to die and honestly it has no bioavailability orally so it's not a big issue but it's still a concern to them for sure Visual impairment's a big one. You know, if they can't see the right drug or the dose because the print on the bottles is pretty small in a lot of cases there. Um, decreased swallowing ability. Oh, that, I forgot to mention the drug bottles themselves, you know, to make sure that um, a lot of them come as child resistant, uh, but a lot of elderly patients can't get those open, you know, so we make sure that they have the ability to even get into their pill bottles in the first place, right? Um, 
from a IV access standpoint, you tend to find, especially a lot of these frequent flyers, they'll come in a lot and they will develop um, issues of um, like scar tissue over common IV sites. Um, you may find that frequently they're dehydrated, which also makes it difficult to get a stick. And so that can be um, come dif become a uh, issue of getting actual medications into the patient due to this decreased access here. And then not only that, but as the patients get older, they're kind of like, you know, I don't even need that treatment. What's the point? I'm only going to get side effects and I'm not going to feel that much better. So at some point you're going to switch over from really caring about the, the quantity of life they have left over to the quality of life. And so that's important to consider where patients are at in terms of their um, mental standpoint of like, what do they want? What's their goals of treatment? And so patients we typically consider to be end of life if they have less than six months to live as predicted. Um, and then, you know, we want to think about things like kind of prioritizing their treatment plans, um, you know, talk about palliative care with them. You know, a lot of people, they get very freaked out when they hear hospice. Um, they think it's like a death sentence, but really palliative care is really the big thing we, we focus on to try to make sure um, that we are increasing their quality of life for them as they kind of get closer um, to their mortality, essentially. And so you can kind of see this um, as time goes on, you know, the palliative treatment, we're working on the pain relief. This gets more important as time goes on towards the patient death. And then eventually afterwards, obviously you care about the family members as well. Caregiver um, uh, grief and, and uh, mental health issues are going to be really a big point to consider as well, especially if you have patients who are chronically giving care to those patients. Um, but again, you notice that the priorities are switching as time goes on. You know, yeah, you care about life extension early on, but later on patients are kind of like, eh, I'm good. I lived a long, full life, and, and that's it, right? Assuming they get a chance to get to that point. So um, let's look at some of the, the normal changes that occur in these elderly patients you expect to see um, typically. So for instance, with like cardiac effects, like we know we're going to expect to see reduced um, LV function, right? We know that we're going to see higher systole uh, systolic arterial pressures and reduced heart rate. Um, from a renal standpoint, this is another really big concern because we know as renal function um as patients get older, renal function should decline, right? Um, they're going to have a decreased ability to really control their GFR. They're not going to be able to maintain acid base balance as well. Um, this is like those patients I mentioned that would say were on metformin for a really long time. They've been on it for decades potentially. And you'll find that as they get older, no one really went back and addressed their renal function. And so they get you know, this decrease in renal function, maybe they get sick and maybe they stopped having good PO intake. They have an acute decrease in kidney function. And now all of a sudden they get this lactic acidosis. It's further exacerbated by the point that they can't really maintain their normal balance as well anyway. So you can see how these patients can decline pretty quickly if no one's really going back and addressing these things. And some patients, they are in the nursing home, they don't get really looked after that well. And so it's very easy for these patients to have really de acute decreases in function that no one's really caught until they get really sick and they come into the ER. And so just so you can kind of give you a graphical representation of the effects you're going to see as time goes on, we know that everything starts failing. Unfortunately, here right at 30, it's like it's already downhill from there. So that's why everything just starts hurting when you turn 30. For some of us, we're already there. But um, yeah, so again, these are normal functions. And again, if you catch them here and you start dosing medications at this point, you got to consider what's going to happen 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, and make sure that we're going back and addressing these sort of things. So um, other things we're going to expect to see, typically in terms of like GI effects, we're not going to expect to see um, huge changes in terms of like bioavailability of medications. More likely than not, you're going to run into issues of um, you know things like gastric motility being impaired, especially if you have medications that are affecting this, especially if you have um, things like you know gastroparesis as related to like diabetic complications. Um, you may find that you're going to have issues in terms of like liver function over time, especially with comorbid conditions. You know, um, we know that if you have decreased blood flow coming through the liver, that's going to decrease metabolism just because the drug is not being presented to the liver to be metabolized, right? So if you have CHF and you have a lot of liver congestion, that's going to overall decrease metabolism and extend the half-life of a lot of those medications, right? So again, these are things you want to take into account and expect to occur, and we can monitor for these things as well, assuming we have a good monitoring plan in place. So as I mentioned, not a lot of absorption changes, but these are a huge source of drug interaction. So you have to make sure you're assessing what your patients are taking in terms of food um, and what they're taking in terms of like OTC uh, medications that they may not even really consider to be drugs when you ask them about it. Um, are they taking laxatives? Are they taking antacids? You know, a lot of these things are going to either um, bind up with medications or they're going to cause, you know, for instance, they're taking fiber every morning for their constipation. They take their medications at the same time. That frequently binds up a lot of drugs and so you got to make sure that they're not uh, they're separating those out by a decent amount of time right 
Of course, gastric uh, emptying being impaired can slow down absorption as well, and this is more often in, in diabetic patients. So um, other things you're going to find, drug distribution, this is an important concept here to understand because overall you're going to find that patients, um, as they become older, you're going to have reduced lean body mass and overall reduced body water. So this is a good table to kind of compare um, the two here. So imagine someone who's a little bit younger, say in their 20s and 30s versus an older person, say 60s to 80s. Um, you can see here that the body water content is going to go down, right? You can see that their lean body mass is going to go down, but their percent body fat typically increases. So what does that mean in terms of drug distribution? Well, you can expect things like lipophilic medications to have a higher volume distribution. They're gonna be more likely to partition out into that um, adipose tissue, right? Versus things with, say, low volume distribution, things that are more hydrophilic, tend to concentrate more in the blood. And so again, that can have direct effects in terms of like therapeutic monitoring to seeing like what blood levels you're getting there um, as a result of these changes in distribution. Not only that, but if you consider things like serum albumin, typically goes down as patients get older, and this can be exacerbated by chronic illness or say poor nutrition and things like that, such that you may find that if you have a drug that's say like highly protein bound, so imagine like phenytoin, right? You have an elderly patient with seizure disorder and they have phenytoin on board that's say 90% protein bound, okay, to albumin. And you have now decreases in albumin levels. That means that free fraction that was 10%, say in a typical healthy patient, is now gone up to say 15%, right? It's a 50% increase in the amount of free drug available that's gonna have big effects in terms of the mental status changes, in terms of ataxia, in terms of fall risk, right? So these are things you have to watch out for. And if you can do things like check free levels of drugs, if it's available, that can be really helpful. So Finitone's a really good example of something you can do a free level for and actually check to see what's actually available at the receptor sites, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, decreases in protein binding tends to affect um, uh, things that, uh, that are highly protein bound. They're gonna have a higher free fraction that can distribute out into that tissue. Um, big things are gonna affect this though tend to be nutritional status, but you may have drug interactions where something will come along and kick it off of that protein. So it's usually due to drug interactions with polypharmacy that you'll see. Um, but you may find different changes in proteins like certain drug binding proteins like alpha acid glycoprotein uh, may increase, right? So it could be variable, but know that when you're looking at your drug references and you're looking at drug dosing, especially changes for elderly patients, these are what they're taking into account, right? You may not need to know the exact mechanisms here, but this is the kind of the background of what's going on when you're looking at those drug references. So kidney function, this is a big one I'm gonna harp on because this is a frequent problem you run into with elderly patients. Uh, I cannot tell you how many patients I see coming into the ER um, as a result of drug toxicity because of decreased kidney function that no one caught, right? Either due to a chronic issue uh, that's been sort of lingering over a long period of time or an acute issue that happens due to, say, acute kidney injury, okay? So one of the big things you're gonna see is that the serum creatinine may not really be proportional to their decrease in creatinine clearance. So what do I mean by that? So normally you'd expect someone, say a healthy adult patient, if their creatinine clearance goes down, you'd expect their serum creatinine to increase, right? That makes sense. So say for instance, their baseline creatinine is say 0.6 grams per deciliter. If it goes up to 1.2, so it has a doubling, um, you'd expect, okay, well, yeah, that person has a pretty big decrease in, in kidney function because I can see they're holding on to all that extra creatinine. Well, what if that patient didn't have a lot of creatinine to make in the first place? So let's say for instance, they have uh, muscle wasting due to chronic illness, or you know, they're, imagine like you know, grandmas that are like, you know, 85 pounds sopping wet just due to the fact they just don't have a lot of muscle mass left. Or imagine that amputation, like say you have a really uncontrolled diabetic and they have uh, below the knee amputation, right? All that's gonna decrease the amount of muscle mass they have to produce that creatinine. And so what you end up getting for a lot of these elderly patients is a falsely low serum creatinine which tends to falsely overestimate what their creatinine function or their extra creatinine clearance is. And so you can have an elderly patient that's the 85 year olds in the ICU for sepsis and their creatinine's like 0.7. You're like, wow, that's pretty good for you know an 85 year old. It's like, well, no, it's, it's just they don't have any muscle mass to produce a lot of creatinine. Like it's, if they had all that extra body mass, they're probably much higher than that, probably be in the 1.5, 1.6 range. So it's easy to overestimate the renal function and be too aggressive in your drug dosing because you're, we know these patients are gonna have prolonged half-life of drugs and they're gonna be more likely to see those increased concentrations up to the toxic levels. So again, be really cautious there. Uh, kind of a general rule of thumb that I like to use uh, for patients who are elderly like that, so especially like in their like late 70s and 80s, if their creatinine is less than one, actually I just bump it up to one when I do my calculations, just so I can be a little more conservative because I'd rather give a little less drug and not cause toxicity 
maybe risk being a little under less efficacious and because i can always increase the dose right i can always give more drug if need be um this is highly affected by hydration status as well. So you want to make sure that you're looking at patient's hydration status. Make sure what see what their PO intake is. Are they getting enough water? If not, this can be a really big uh, cause for an acute uh, decrease in kidney function that may lead them to coming to the ER, for instance. So just to give an example, right? So this is the cockroft galt equation that most of us have seen before, mainly due to my lectures. Um, and this is something that, um, again, this is not the best equation to use for your elderly patients or other ones that are out there. So for instance, like this MDRD equation. Um, but again, the, the variables are what I want you to look at, right? So that way you kind of have an inherent understanding of how changes in elderly patients are gonna be affecting their creatinine clearance. And so for the first thing here, you're gonna see the age. As age goes up, because of 140 minus age, this value is gonna get smaller and smaller as we get older and older. So we know that as age goes up, we know the creatinine clearance is gonna have a decrease, right? We know it's gonna go down. This is gonna be a proportional decrease here. We know that serum creatinine is in the denominator here. So as serum creatinine goes up, we expect creatinine clearance to also go down. But remember, this may be falsely decreased in those patients due to decreased lean body mass due to amputations, due to all of that. So you've got to be really cautious in evaluating this to make sure you're not overestimating what the creatinine clearance is. And of course, you always want to consider like, are we multiplying by 0.85 for women? Because they tend to have uh, more adipose tissue on average than male patients. You know, you want to take into account that. Um, you know, for instance, like the MDRD equation, they take into account if the subject is black or not. Um, so it just depends on the model that you're using, but you'll put in all these variables when you're calculating it out, and they'll give you a uh, basic understanding of kind of what their creatinine clearance is like. So other changes we can expect to see is that drug clearance from the liver is going to slow down, mainly because uh, especially as hepatic blood flow decreases and slows down, you're going to see less drug kind of being extracted uh, from that blood there. Uh, you may also see this can affect things like first pass metabolism and bioavailability. Um, so for instance, if you're seeing decreased function of a lot of those phase one and phase two reactions, you tend to see more activity decrease in the phase one reactions, specifically your SIP enzymes, um, that may lead to decreased metabolism. So what does that mean? Well, not only does that increase the half-life of your drugs, but maybe that actually increases the bioavailability such that you get kind of more effect out of the drug for a given dose than what you would expect to see, and thus it can lead to toxicities, right? So again, for some drugs, you may want to actually decrease the dose you're giving due to the fact that you know that first pass metabolism is going to be diminished. Um, and again, you know, you, you wonder, is it just that patients that are elderly are more sensitive to the medications? A lot of it has to do with the fact that one, the pharmaco uh, pharmacokinetics are different based on what we've already discussed so far, but we also find that they tend to have kind of a lessened homeostatic response. They are not really able to maintain homeostasis as easily as a younger patient, right? So they can't regulate temperature as well. You cannot regulate their blood pressure as well. Actually, uh, the temperature thing is kind of funny because that's when I first knew that my patient or my parents were getting old uh, is when I actually went back to my parents' house and I walked in, I'm just like, it's like 78 degrees in here. I'm like, and they're just like comfortable. They're just happy as clams. And I'm just like sitting there sweating. I'm like, what is going on here? I was like, oh no, they're getting old. They can't regulate their temperature anymore. Um, so things like that, right? So again, um, you're gonna see these changes occur. And so, you know, cardiac output, causing things like postural, uh, postural hypotension, uh, fasting blood glucose, all these things are gonna be, can become less well controlled as they get older. So I wanna take a, a few minutes here to look at specific drug class examples and things that are more likely to be problematic in elderly patients and things I want you to think about in terms of um, risk uh, for these patients here, right? Because again, it's always um, considering the risk versus the benefits of these drugs. And so here are some that um, you wanna be pretty cognizant of and think about prior to prescribing for your patients, okay? So getting into specific drug classes here, um, in general, you wanna be really cautious with using sedative hypnotic agents. And so what do I mean by that, right? I'm talking about about things like benzodiazepines, I'm talking about muscle relaxants, I'm talking about um, sleep medications, all those things tend to, one, have pharmacokinetic issues to where you may find that they have increased half-lives. Not only that, but some of these drugs have active metabolites, meaning that you metabolize the drug, but it has a, a secondary metabolite that still has activity, still does the same thing that the parent drug does. And so because of that, you want to make sure that if we're, it basically extends the, the duration of action of the drug pretty significantly, especially if they can't clear that metabolite so well. And that does increase your risk for things like falls and ataxia or altered mental status, right? I've had patients that have come into the ER, their, their family is really concerned about them saying, yeah, grandma's just not acting right anymore. And it may be that she's having worse than dementia, um, but it could be related to the medication they just started on the patient, right? Related to the set of hypnotics. 
And so that's when I talk about things like benzodiazepines. Remember, I talked about those lot benzodiazepines being really nice for elderly patients. It was lorazepam, oxazepam, triazolam, and temazepam. The reason why we like those four benzodiazepines in elderly patients more so than the others is because they have uh, no active metabolites. They have uh, more renal clearance, such that they're easier to clear than something that's more lipophilic uh, that sticks right in the, in the adipose tissue for longer, right? Um, and so, again, you want to be cautious here with these drugs, especially when you're combining with anything else, especially alcohol is a big one, right? Um, with analgesics, you're going to see that, especially the opioids, um, again, that's going to depress their, their mental status, right? Especially if you combine them with muscle relaxants or other sedative hypnotics. Um, but also, they may be more susceptible to the respiratory depressive effects, especially if you imagine someone like a COPD patient who is, or say they have um, uh, chronic obstructive sleep apnea, right? Um, they are used to having higher CO2 levels at baseline anyway. And if you give an opioid that depresses that respiratory drive even further, that can lead to some pretty significant side effects, right? Um, and so again, be cautious about these things. Be cognizant of sort of the other comorbid conditions, how they may interact with the medications we're giving. Not only that, but you may see that certain drugs do have accumulation of active metabolites. Um, so for instance, there used to be a, an opioid on the market. It was taken out um, probably actually when I was in pharmacy school, but it was called propoxyphene. And propoxyphene um, was not a great drug in elderly patients, uh, mainly because it had a metabolite called norpropoxyphene. And if you had poor renal function, you couldn't clear it very well. And so these elderly patients would build up levels of norpropoxyphene and actually led to seizures and led to dysrhythmias. And so because of that, they said, well, the risk of it are so high that let's just take it off the market altogether. And so you'll never see it in your lifetime, in your clinical uh, career, but it was something that was used in a ton of elderly patients for a really long time. Another good example of that is meperidine. Uh, meperidine, if you recall, the brand name was Demerol, and I had a, a pain management pharmacist in school who always called it Demonol. And basically, the only place you're going to see Demerol being used nowadays is in surgery in order to prevent rigors as a result of you know, anesthetics and whatnot. Um, but we used to use it for pain management all the time, and we hated it because elderly patients would accumulate a metabolite that led to seizures. And so, again, you have to consider the metabolism, the kinetics of these drugs, and what makes them maybe not so suitable for these elderly patients. Uh, lithium can be a big one. We typically try to avoid lithium in elderly patients mainly due to the fact that, um, one, the side effect profile is not as nice as you will see with some of the other um, drugs we use for bipolar disorder nowadays, you know, things like, you know, your valproic acids or carbamazepine. But, you know, certainly because lithium is so dependent on renal function in order to clear it, uh, imagine if I had a patient who's on lithium, they're elderly, and I start them on an NSAID, right? You know, NSAIDs can increase levels of lithium because they decrease GFR, right? Um, especially they're really dependent on the prostaglandins to, to keep a GFR constant. Um, you know, if you see concomitant diuretics that cause you to hold on to salt more, that'll cause increased lithium accumulation, you know? things like that. Um, antidepressants are a big one. We know that patients, as they get elderly, we worry about behavioral health issues in terms of like depression and whatnot, but think about the medications that may or may not be really appropriate for them. So um, TCAs are not great in elderly patients because of their really strong anticholinergic properties, right? So maybe something you want to watch out for, um, especially TCAs having alpha antagonism can increase risk for falls and hypotension. So it's not great. Nowadays, though, we have a lot safer agents, and so things like SSRIs are much better for the patient population. So, say something like amitriptyline, not great, whereas nowadays we can use something like, say, citalopram or fluoxetine, be much safer for that, that patient population. Uh, in terms of cardiovascular agents, this one gets tricky because of the fact that a lot of these patients have cardiovascular complications, right? They have hypertension, they have CHF, they have MI uh, in their past. So, um, again, any antihypertensive especially anything that directly causes vasorelaxation. So you would think about your um, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. You think about hydralazine. You think about your alpha blockers. Anything that directly dilates those vessels is going to be more likely to cause orthostatic hypotension, right? But also think about things like, um, say, for instance, you stand up and you need to increase that blood pressure. You can do vasoconstriction, but you can also do things that like increase cardiac output. Well, what would happen if you had a beta blocker on board, right? And all of a sudden that increase in cardiac output is diminished because of the beta blockade you have going on now. So again, any of these things can be causing issues here. Um, electrolyte disturbances are quite frequent, especially with diuretic use. So you can see loss of magnesium and potassium, calcium, uh, hyponatremia can develop, you know, so you wanna be really cautious here, especially with your loop diuretics, especially with FCHF, um, these are more likely to occur. 
But keep in mind other electrolyte imbalances that can happen here as well. So imagine you have someone with poor kidney function and we start them on an ACE inhibitor. You know, which electrolyte disturbance might you see there? Well, we can expect that our potassium is going to increase and hyperkalemia can be a problem, right? Um, so that kind of feeds into the issues of antiarrhythmics, right? So again, if a patient does have an arrhythmia, they have pretty poor hemodynamic reserve to really combat that. And so you're going to find that antiarrhythmics tend to be, um, the risk for causing arrhythmia are going to be exacerbated by electrolyte disturbances. So if they are hypomagnesemic or if they are hypokalemic or hyperkalemic, for that means, um, you're going to see more likely a risk for um, uh arrhythmias and dysfunction from occurring there, right? Not only that, but you have extended half-life, a lot of drugs like quinidine or procainamide and whatnot. So you gotta be really cautious there. Um, actually, this is a really good point to bring up. So um, I don't know if anyone has uh, heard about it, but you know, there was uh, some thought that uh, the drug uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine may be effective against the coronavirus. Not only that, but you can also use something like azithromycin, right? Now, there's no clinical evidence to show that yet. There's some very small trials that may have some, um, you know, conflicting data. Um, but as of right now, there's no strong recommendations for or against the use. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of hoarding of things like hydroxychloroquine. and we're starting to see um, people are trying to buy up as much as they can. And in fact, um, people are starting to buy up things like aquarium. Like if you go to an aquarium store, um, you can buy chloroquine because it's an antiparasitic used for fish. And actually one person died from that because they're taking a bunch of chloroquine, they didn't even have coronavirus, and they are dying because of the anti or because of the arrhythmias caused by something like chloroquine. Um, and so again, due to these electrolyte imbalances, they may be more at risk for developing this. So if you have an elderly patient and they're really scared about coronavirus and they decide that they're going to get a prescription for hydroxychloroquine, well, that can prolong QTC. And if they're hypomagnesemic and their potassium is off, and then that increases their risk for torsades. And so then they end up dying from the treatment, which is worse than maybe potentially the disease itself might have been, right? So again, th there are real world complications for these, or implications for these kind of things here. So um, overall, we know that we expect that as you increase the number of drugs they're on, they're gonna increase the number of adverse drug reactions that can occur here, right? And so if you imagine just a single medication uh, being a 10% you know, risk for causing ADR, by the time you get to 10 medications or more, it's almost nearly gonna be 100%. And so you have to make sure patients know that, hey, um, you know, these are things to expect to see, and not just, you know, they just assume that, okay, I'm getting older, this is just happening. Like, now I get dizzy every time I get up, right? That may not be normal. That may just be the medication that you're prescribing to them, right? And then always ask about OTCs, ask about herbal medications. I know I've mentioned this one before, but, you know, a lot of your herbals, especially like your G, anything that starts with a G for the most part, like ginseng, ginkgo, and whatnot, um, they tend to cause bleeding effects. They tend to, um, you know, decrease uh, platelet function. And elderly patients, they may worry about their memory. And so I had one that took warfarin along with ginkgo biloba, and they came with a massive head bleed, and I'm dying from that, right? So um, don't just poo-poo the idea of herbals. You know, be honest and, and curious about it and say, hey, you know, do you take any of these things? Because if they're not going to tell you, then that could lead to some pretty significant interactions. So in terms of other things to consider as well as prescribing errors happen pretty frequently in this uh, population. So one that you don't take into age related changes into account, right? So you don't look at their re renal function. You don't look at their liver function prior to, to dosing or uh, prior to prescribing. Um, patient compliance errors can occur here. Are they taking the drugs too frequently? Are they not taking it often enough? Um, this is where the teach back method is really important, especially if you're concerned about cognitive um, understanding from your patients. So have them teach back to you how they think they should take the medication, and that will uncover if there is any sort of discrepancy between what you're prescribing and what their understanding is of that prescription. And then huge issue is seeing multiple providers, right? So again, um, frequently you may be that central person they're seeing, especially if you're working like you know primary care. Um, they may be seeing a, a orthopedic person, they may be seeing a rheumatologist, they may be seeing a um, pain management doc, they may be seeing a cardiologist. All these different people may not have a full understanding of everything else that's going on for that patient there. They're only looking at it from one perspective. And so you may be that central person that's dealing with all these different scripts going on from these different providers. And I will tell you that most people are very hesitant to mess with someone else's work. So if the cardiologist prescribes something, the patient comes in, you notice something like say there's a drug interaction that's happening here. Um, most people are very hesitant to stop or m modify any of these therapies because they don't want to make the other person mad, right? There's a personal, a professional respect between providers, I suppose. Um, but 
somebody needs to be able to say, hold on a second, let me call this person, let me talk to them, let me let them know that, hey, you know, this drug that the uh, pain management doc is prescribing is interacting with this drug that the cardiologist prescribed, and try to have that sort of um, communication between providers to make sure that you're taking the best care of the patient. Because again, the other patients that have been on, um, you know, we do these brown bag events um, in pharmacy school where patients would bring out their little brown bags, all their medications, and there's drugs that are prescribed. We have therapeutic duplications. You'd have different muscle uh, relaxants from multiple providers. You'd have uh, multiple antihypertensives that other providers didn't know were being prescribed. It's just a mess, right? So it leads to a lot of interactions, leads to hospitalizations at some point. So it's really, really important to make sure you have a full understanding of what's going on. And then, of course, you know, some patients may not even understand that certain drugs are drugs, right? So I mentioned BC powders and goodies powders. Um, this is a particular thing I see more in the South a lot of times. Um, and these are patients that are taking aspirin-based products but may not even realize that they actually contain aspirin. They just take them every time they get a headache, right? They don't even know what's in it. So if they're on an aspirin for cardiac protection and then they take a goodies powders, it's easy to see how they could kind of dose stack. And then all of a sudden you have um, aspirin toxicity. So for instance, I, I probably told this story before, but um, say, for instance, uh, one patient who every time they had chest pain, they would just take a goodies powder. Someone told them just take a goodies, right? And so they would take it every single time. Um, and this guy had really poorly controlled angina. And so he took probably three or four doses of full strength aspirin and then, you know, decided, hey, my chest pain is not going away. I'm going to call 911. Calls 911. EMS shows up and says, hey, have you had any aspirin today? And the guy says, no. Guess what? They give him aspirin. Guy gets into the ER. The resident hey, says, hey, have you had any aspirin today? The guy says no, because he's elderly. He didn't know what was being given to him via EMS. And they give him another dose of aspirin. Now all of a sudden the guy's like, hey, my hearing's really muffled, and he's got a fever, and all of a sudden he's got aspirin toxicity that now we're dealing with on top of the MI he was having, right? So it's easy to really kind of um, run into issues if patients don't really understand what's going on in terms of their own medical care in a lot of cases. So... Um, some things you can do, right? So I think having a really structured history in terms of their medications is really important, especially um, on initial evaluation of a patient. And certainly these are things you want to ask about changes as time goes on. So, um, you know, one, making sure they understand the drugs that they are prescribed in terms of like dosage, frequency, the dosage form they should be taking, et cetera. Um, you know, if they're deviating from that, you know, what are they doing, right? If maybe they forget to take a dose, what do they do to, to counteract that? Do they just skip it? Do they double up on a dose later on, which may be not appropriate depending on the drug? Uh, what do they do, right? Um, asking about things they can get without a prescription. You may see OTC, and they may not understand what that is. They say, I don't know what OTC means. Of course, I'm not taking that. Um, but they say, anything you can get without a prescription may be more descriptive to them. They may understand what you're asking at that point, right? Um, are they not taking medication? Are they taking medications not on that list, right? So if they're getting something from the front ethyl down the street, or maybe they got from their cousin in Canada. These are things they may be not as likely to tell you about, but you want to at least be curious and say, hey, I don't really care if you are taking, I just want to know about all the meds you're taking. And that may be more descriptive to you, getting a full history. Um, talking about things like homeopathic meds, herbal medications, vitamins, right? All these can have an impact and you want to ask about it in a very curious, non-judgmental manner. So that way they're more likely to stay open to you and, and have that communication staying uh, strong. Um, you know, are they using anything uh, that's no longer being prescribed? That can be a really big problem too, where they're taking meds that they haven't been prescribed in years, but they keep around just in case. You know, maybe they have part of a Z-Pack that they didn't take. Uh, now they're going to take it later on, right? They may interact with some of their other meds they're on now, right? Um, and then making sure they're checking expiration dates. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, a lot of times expiration dates are not... Um, they're kind of bogus in a lot of cases, but some drugs are really important, right? So for instance, like, um, you know, liquid antibiotics that you typically get, those are, typically have a pretty short duration of action. Um, they have a pretty short expiration date, um, whereas other things may last for longer. So you at least want to assess that. And hopefully they're only taking meds that are in date. Um, you know, if they're not taking medications independently, but if they're having someone help them, like who's helping them? Is that a consistent source of help, you know, or is that only, you know, their, their kid that can come by a couple times a week? Is that the only time they're taking their medications, you know? Um, if they're having, um, you know, what kind of memory systems are they using? Do they use a phone to help them out? Is they, they have any kind of apps or anything? Those things can be useful there. Um, Oh, um, Kylie asked, you know, what, what effect would it be when they take expired medication? A lot of times nothing, right? So I'll tell you, um, so when you prescribe a medication, does anyone um, recall sort of like the, the length of time that a prescription is good for? It's like a non-controlled uh, medication. Who knows? But basically, uh, they have that period of time. And that's what's going to be printed on the bottle itself. And so basically what you're going to find is that um, 
the actual expiration on the, the bottle that the thing came from, yeah, so Emily it was correct. It says one year. So a prescription is only good for a year. So, so let's say I get a prescription for metoprolol, right? Um, I can go to the pharmacy, and that bottle that they're pulling the metoprolol out of may expire, say, in 2024, let's say, for instance, right? Um, and so when I get that bottle, though, from the pharmacist, it's just going to be printed on there one year from today's date or one year from the script that was done, because that's the how long that prescription is good for. Is that medications in that bottle any less effective than what was from that parent bottle? Well, no, it's going to still be good to that time frame. So there's that aspect of it, but actually there's a really um, interesting study, um, well, interesting to probably me and no one else on this uh, chat here, but basically there was a study done where they actually uh, went there's a pharmacy that was closing down. I think the owner had died or something. Is a really old school pharmacist. And they had medications from like the 1800s practically, right? And they actually went back and they tested all these medications with GC mass spec to see what was the given percentages um, based off of what was stated in there. So if it was a 10 milligram tablet, how much of that drug was still left? Was it you know 9 milligrams or 0 milligrams? And honestly, most of them were still pretty close to what their actual stated dosage form was. Um, so again, probably nothing. Um, for the most part, you might see lessened effect, right? So that's really kind of the big issues with taking expired medications. You may see less of an effect, but um, for the most part, medications stay good for a long period of time. More likely than not, the problem though is that patients are going to be um, taking medications past when you tell them to stop taking them, right? So you may say, hey, stop taking your hydrochlorothiazide, but they still have, you know, 180 pills around. They may not get that message and, and they keep taking it for a long period of time, right? I think that's cool. That's great, Melanie. You get extra points on no assignments, but it's okay. Um, anyway, so uh, other things you want to check out as well in, in terms of they're taking medications. Um, big things to consider is inhalation therapy, right? So again, technique is so, so important for inhalation therapy with inhalers, especially. So for instance, if you're using uh, a meter dose inhaler, like an albuterol inhaler, um, do they even have the physical dexterity to coordinate between pressing that canister to inhaling that medication? Or do they use a valve holding chamber that can help them out with that, right? Um, is it a dry powder inhaler? Do they even have the inspiratory force necessary to inhale that drug, right? These are things you can kind of look at. Maybe switching them to a nebulizer may be a good idea or using an alternative dosage form. Um, you know, eye drops, are they having any difficulties there? Are they making sure they're keeping it clean such that they don't cause themselves ocular infections, right? And as I mentioned, they forget meds, you know, what do they do to counteract that in those cases there, right? So again, just an idea of kind of common things you should ask about, especially in first intake or first exposure to a patient um, to make sure you get a full idea of what they're taking, how they're taking it, and, and how to go from there, right? Again, here's some ideas of things they can use to help out um, in terms of like memory aids. Um, I personally, I hate these things so much and the reason why i hate these is to be from a poison center standpoint because we would have kids who would accidentally end up taking these so basically um i would get a call from the poison center mom had taken the kid to go hang out with grandma and grandpa and they say oh well the kid got into the pill minder and i have no idea what's missing i don't know what was supposed to be in which container i don't know which ones are gone which ones are on the floor it's always a nightmare because then i'm like kind of going to worst case scenario you know it, it's bad, right? But for the patients, though, this is great, right? It helps really helps them kind of keep track in terms of like when they're taking medications, how often, etc. They need help with this, though, in a lot of cases, especially if they have memory impairment, for someone to actually kind of set this up. So I always recall, you know, my mom, you know, every single Sunday night, she would come by and she would kind of set up the whole pill minder for my grandpa for the week, right? Um, and so that was just kind of their their um, routine that they got into to make sure that he remembered to take things when he was supposed to. So um, some other things as well, uh, consider medication costs. You know, um, costs can be a really big issue for these patients. They tend to be on a fixed income. And so you may have like the greatest new drug that's out there, but if the patients can't you know, fill it because it's too expensive, then that's not really gonna be all that effective. Or maybe you're giving them some uh, samples to get them through a couple weeks or so or a month, but then they can't afford to follow up after that. You know, the medication may work great for that month, but then if they can't afford any further dosing, then that's gonna be a problem, right? Um, making sure that patients, you know, if they have mixed dosing intervals to try to get a schedule down to where they can kind of um, take things together effectively and, and try to decrease that, that non-compliance there. Um, but also think about things like, you know, intelligent non-compliance, like are patients telling you they're taking something like they're supposed to when they're really not and trying to make sure that your lines of communication are good um, and open with those patients to make sure they they feel comfortable telling you things like, hey, you know, it's okay if you miss a dose or two, but I just want to know about it. I want to know. And so we can maybe come up with some strategies to get around that sort of issue, right? 
And then uh, obviously, like I mentioned with the inhaled drugs, like can they even physically take it? You know, are, are they having issues in terms of, um, do they have dysphagia due to say Parkinson's, they can't swallow medications. Maybe they need to switch them back over to liquid medications. Or maybe they're having such memory impairment, I need to switch them over to a transdermal patch, right? These are all things you can try to uh, pinpoint in terms of ways to increase that compliance. So um, that's it for the geriatric section. Again, a little more conceptual, but I want you to think about like the medications we've already talked about over the past year and think about things like how might this be working differently or what kind of effects might you expect to see in elderly patients I may not see in say younger, healthier patients and think about the consequences thereof, right? So if I ask a question, um, say on a test and I say something like, you know, which one of these medications are most likely to lead to orthostatic hypotension? And I say something like, you know, a beta blocker and hydralazine and uh, amlodipine and say herbisartan well you know we know that beta blockers decrease cardiac outputs okay so that can lead to orthostatic hypotension i know that you know direct vasodilators like calcium channel blockers and, and hydralazine can do that but you know things like arbs and, and ace inhibitors are much less likely right so Think about mechanistically things that are, um, you know, more or less likely to cause issues in these patients here. Um, think about things that cause constipation. Think about things like anticholinergic causing um, ultra mental status, you know, things like that. These are all things I want you to consider with all the medications we talked about in terms of how they might be affecting these elderly patients due to their decreased homeostatic responses and changes in, in kinetics. So um, that's it for today. Uh, hopefully you'll got something uh, useful out of that. Is there any questions I can answer? Uh, so far, if you want to put them in the chat, I'm going to check the board real quick. Uh, how are herbals like ginkgo biloba even legal? That's a good question. So um, herbal supplements are pretty um, interesting. They're kind of an interesting challenge in terms of pharmacotherapy, mainly because um, when you look at their marketing, because again, they, they do stuff, right? So it's easy to say, well, herbals don't work. They, they're they just ho hocus pocus. They're, they're nothing, right? They, they do have pharmacologic effects, but because of the fact that they're not regulated by the FDA, they undergo, there's a certain law, there's an herbal supplements law that, or dietary supplements law they fit underneath. And basically it says that as long as they're not marketing themselves for any particular health condition. So I can't have an herbal that says this treats diabetes, right? But I can't say it helps promote good metabolism, right? I can say uh, like health benefits that are very vague and that's okay for the marketing. And so as long as I do that, um, then the FDA doesn't really regulate it. And you can basically put whatever you want in those, those capsules, right? So there's no one that goes through and actually make sure that you say there's you know 20 milligrams of ginkgo by low, but there's actually 20 milligrams of ginkgo in there. Where the FDA will come into play is going to be if there is health concerns. So for instance, like I remember HydroxyCut had a particular uh, variety of it that got taken off the market because there's um, cases of liver dysfunction happening. Or if the marketing starts to say things like helps you know, helps, um, you know, treat diabetes, then the FDA will definitely come down and say, Hey, that's false advertising. You can't say that you don't have scientific evidence to back that up. We're going to take you down. Right. Um, so it's, it's interesting, but you know, certainly, certainly something you want to be cognizant of. Let's see. Uh, Emily asks, well, I heard COVID-19 binds to ACE receptors in the lungs. Does this mean it can kick ACE inhibitors off the receptors, causing them to not work or would ACE inhibitor be protective? That's a really good question. I looked this up. Um, uh, and so essentially what's uh, happening here with, with uh, coronavirus is it actually will bind to ACE2. And so again, there's a different uh, ACE enzyme. So there's ACE1, which is what we typically think about when we think ACE inhibitors and in treatment of hypertension and, and uh, used in MI and things like that. That's ACE1. There's ACE2, which actually is interesting because it actually has sort of an anti-RAS system sort of effect because it actually metabolizes angiotensin 2 to an inactive metabolite. So if anything, it kind of helps out with blood pressure. But we have ACE2 receptors that are located on these type 2 uh, pneumocysts in the lungs, and they will actually, uh, the, the virus will actually bind to that, and that's how it gets translocated into those type 2 pneumocytes, right? So um, I looked it up, and there's actually a statement from the AHA and a couple other um, cardiology associations, and they say that so far, we don't know that there's any interaction between patients on ACE inhibitors or ARBs and interaction with um, uh, coronavirus, right? There may be some theoretical concern that if there is some lack of selectivity such that uh, an ACE inhibitor may be affecting um, uh, you know, maybe affecting the ACE2 enzyme, that maybe that would help increase the, or actually, I'm sorry, um, there's some concern, theoretical concern, that using ACE inhibitor actually causes upregulation of ACE2 that would actually increase the amount of virus getting into the cells, but that has not been borne out in any sort of literature. But again, it's super early, 
So if there is a concern, if there is an interaction, we don't know about it yet. Um, so far, the uh, you know American Heart Association, all of them, so far what we know now, and this is like from May twenty or March twenty eighth when this came out, um, they said that. There's no reason to stop taking your ACE inhibitors, no reason to stop taking your ARBs, um, unless there's some new evidence that comes out that says otherwise. So it's an interesting thought, um, but I don't know if it has any clinical impact yet. We just don't know, right? Okay, would you say this lecture requires review of past lectures or should we focus on the meds that are outlined in this lecture? Um, I mentioned some of the more salient points, so I think that's good um, to recall that. But I mean, like, you know, uh, if you want to review the high risk medications we talked about, like your opioids, if you want to review the cardiovascular meds, um, you know, at least in terms of like mechanisms and things like that, that might be helpful, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm going to give some clinical scenarios asking you, like, hey, which one of these medications seems most likely to be an issue? Or I may ask you, you know, which med one of these medications may be safest? Uh, for a patient uh, to help with them, their sleep, for instance, you know, things like that. So um, some review might be helpful. And it's always good to recover or recall this stuff because you're going to need to know it for pants anyway. So, you know, there's that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Cam asked, uh, have you ever recorded a show and started watching a little later so you could buzz through the commercials? I was able to do something similar with this video and pause. Why? Way better than on Zoom. That's cool. Um, I'm glad that works better than Zoom. If it seems like it's working out, so I might stick with this uh, for the uh, foreseeable future here. Let's see. Uh, how would uh, I wish I had more commercials here? I could make some extra cash on the side, but no, no commercial, um, no advertisers uh, have come beating down my door yet, unfortunately. But um, all right, Stephanie asks, how would a chloroquine or azithromycin even be effective against COVID-19? Wouldn't antivirals be more promising? That's a really good question. I've been looking up this too because obviously we have more time, so I can do a lot of research. Um, Anyway, so the thought process is is with uh, coronavirus uh, causing COVID-19, right? So you have coronavirus, which is actually the virus itself, and you have COVID-19, which is like the disease, right? So that's basically the, the respiratory distress syndrome that can happen there. Um, essentially, it's not the virus itself that's so problematic. It's our immune response to it that is an issue. And so you end up seeing that um, when these uh, type 2 pneumocytes get infected with the virus, that it starts to cause eventually cell death to occur. And that causes the immune system to come into attack it. And so we have this really over-exaggerated immune response to things like macrophages and neutrophils all kind of attacking those dead tissues. And that leads to that respiratory distress syndrome. And if you think about it too, those type 2 pneumocytes actually... Um, Type 2 pneumocytes actually cause surfactant to be produced, right? And imagine if you decrease surfactant production, just like we saw with like premature neonates, um, you can start to have a LVLA collapse and that impairs oxygenation, all of that, right? So um, the immune response is really the big issue. Our immune response is trying to help us, but it's hurting us, right? So the idea is by using something like hydroxychloroquine, and using something like azithromycin, we, well, we know azithromycin has anti-inflammatory properties. We saw that in use for CF in the past, right? We know that hydroxychloroquine, being sort of an anti-rheumatic drug, can have some uh, ability to decrease function of the immune system to some degree, right? We use it for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and things like that. So the idea would be to kind of tamp down the immune system a little bit, keep the immune system from really attacking all that tissue there and causing that respiratory distress syndrome and thus allowing our body more time to heal through it. That's the idea. Um, there are antivirals that are in research right now. Um, I can't remember the name of one off the top of my head, but there's some controversy around one uh, in, in terms of like drug patents and whatnot, but we're looking into it. I know things like lopinavir and ritonavir, which was used for HIV, um, is under research. I know there's a lot of different antivirals that they're looking at. And so again, it's still super new and we just don't know what's gonna work and what's not. Um, let's see. So yeah, so Melanie is absolutely right. That has more anti-inflammatory issues there. And actually, Dr. Wood, you can make bank off ads on your videos. I'll talk to my people. That's fantastic. I don't know who your people are. Hopefully they're better than my people. My people are, are not great. They're just basically a two and a three year old. They have no, no connections to the ad world, unfortunately. So, um, what other questions can I answer for you? I think I have some new sticky notes. Let's see. Uh, why are they saying not to take ibuprofen during the coronavirus? That's another really good question. I like how there's, uh, you know, even though we don't have any drugs to treat coronavirus, there's still a lot of like drug concerns. And so it's good that we can talk about these things. So um, ibuprofen and coronavirus this is really interesting. And there's some other position statements I saw about that as well. And so um, basically there was some early talks from some French doctors, I believe, that they were saying, that, oh, we saw all these really bad outcomes with patients taking ibuprofen. They didn't really specify what that meant, and there's really no mechanism for why that would be the case. And so early on, the, the World Health Organization, the WHO basically said, well, maybe if they have fever, use Tylenol, okay? Um, seems reasonable, though, to use Tylenol as a kind of a first line for fever. That's, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, 
there's really been no evidence to corroborate the idea that ibuprofen leads to worse in outcomes. Again, we don't know really what, I mean, it looks like anecdotal evidence they're using. We just don't know. Um, and so from that standpoint, they said, well, try Tylenol first. And if that doesn't work, then maybe use ibuprofen as a second line agent, which I think is pretty reasonable recommendations anyway. Um, obviously, if they have comorbid conditions, which make ibuprofen and other NSAIDs not really a good idea, like say renal dysfunction, things like that, peptic ulcer disease, maybe avoid it for those reasons as well. But um, those are the, that's the only thing I could tell. That's the only thing I've read up on so far in terms of ibuprofen and coronavirus. Let's see. All right, any other questions I can answer? Thank you all for joining me. I'm glad I have like almost half the class here, so that's fantastic. I'm glad you, hopefully some of you find this um, useful to do it live. I like interacting with you all uh, in a live setting anyway, so that's fantastic. I'll keep using the YouTube for now. I think that's working out pretty well. Uh, and I'll get this posted up uh, as well. So if nothing else, have a great day and I will see you for our next talk, which I think will be Thursday. So. All right, I'll see you then. Bye.